So let me start just by seconding what uh, Josh just said. Thanks, Kevin, for all the work that you've done. I was on the organizing committee, but I certainly did uh, very little of the work, and Kevin gets most of the credit for, for putting this together. So thanks for inviting me to speak as well. So, uh, I'd love me to, what sort of time signals would you like? Um, you have between 40 and 45 minutes. Yeah, around then. And if there are questions going along, uh, feel free to raise them as I'm speaking. I think it'd be uh, good to have more of a workshop style uh, feeling. But if I feel like I need to pass on a question, I'll pass on it until discussion. Okay, so I want to start by thinking of a slightly earlier time. Um, and thinking about how a certain kind of debate and a set of issues were ramified in that earlier discussion in the 17th century. So in the 17th century, at the beginning of the 17th century, we had an enormous success in understanding planetary motions. Kepler had a much more accurate description of planetary motions that he developed in the early 17th century. Um, and this led to a number of physics questions. So does it move? So it actually took a reconsideration of the basic understanding of motion to really answer that question uh, 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 sufficiently. So this is really uh, a line of work that starts in the early 17th, 17th century and takes a while until we actually have a new theory of the causes of motion so that we can say, what are the true motions in the system? What aspects of Kepler's descriptions are really physically significant in the sense of guiding us to understand what the causes of the planetary motions are? There's another kind of debate that you could have imagined having as a result of these questions, and people did have this debate in the 17th and 18th century, given what we then have discovered about dynamics, how does that understanding bear on the questions of origins? In this case, the question of origins would have been framed in terms of what are the origins of our planetary system? So how do we explain how our planetary system formed? And I think it's interesting to try to imagine a kind of Galilean dialogue that could have gone on at this time about how to understand the origins of the system. And all these are actually sort of paraphrases of uh, positions that people developed at the time. So I put the, the, them in the characters of Galileo's dialogue. So the first, Simplicio says, even if in the beginning God had given the world only the form of a chaos as confused as any of the poets could invent, by the laws of nature alone, everything would in the course of time come to be just as we see it now. The world as we see it is entirely indifferent to the initial state. So this is, I'll call this an indifference view, that you can actually kind of ignore the features of the initial state if the laws have a certain type of behavior. Um, Salviati objects and says, no, mere mechanical causes cannot account for the elegant system of the planets with the extremely regular motions of the planets and their satellites, all in the same direction and nearly in the same plane. This improbable arrangement can be best explained as the result of a specially chosen initial state. So this is a, a version of a teleological or kind of anthropic argument, that there's something particularly improbable about what we see, and the only way of explaining that is actually by postulating a special initial state. So it's kind of the opposite of the first view. And then we could have Segredo come in and say, you both presume too much. We face enough difficulty discovering the laws governing the parts of nature accessible to us. We cannot, without the utmost temerity, pretend to determine what laws would govern the very origins of the universe. So a kind of skeptical empiricist who's worried about the extrapolation that would be involved in going from the discovery of the dynamics governing the system to claims about the origins of the system. And so as I said, this is paraphrases of both well, Descartes, Newton, and Hume have each advocated a position along these lines. And you can imagine then a very interesting debate that's uh, going on then that both involves questions of physics about the dynamics that would be relevant here, but also sort of different methodological approaches. Whether you think that the aim of a theory should be to find an indifferent explanation, whether you think it's appropriate to postulate an initial state, or whether you're worried about extrapolating to this sort of regime at all. And so I think this would be a very interesting start. I'm not Galileo. I can't write a wonderful dialogue. So I'll leave it at the statement of the initial position. But I think we can see that there's a parallel with a 21st century debate, where again, we have, we're four decades into a phenomenologically successful development of a theory of the early universe known as inflationary cosmology. And in particular, the uh, observations of the cosmic microwave background uh, 
lend uh, support to inflationary cosmology, and we can ask a variety of questions. So, what aspects of the early universe are physically significant? So, inflation takes various aspects of the early universe as giving us a clue to the dynamics of the earliest phase of evolution, and uh, that then guides the development of the theory. And how does the understanding of dynamics we, we've developed bear on the origins of the universe in relation to these sorts of different methodological orientations that I described before. And here, the most common view that you'll see in the discussions of inflation is a kind of appeal to indifference. It's the first view that seems to fit the best with uh, inflation, that we can explain a lot using inflation without appealing to features of the initial state. And so this is one of the issues that I'm really going to focus on. So overall, I think, so, and recently, uh, I'm not going to talk about the specific issues in this debate in a lot of detail except for one, but throughout the time, I said we've had about 40 years of study of these ideas in the early universe. Um, there have been two issues that I think, there, there are more issues than this, but I think two issues that have resurfaced at different points in the discussion of inflation. The first is, how should inflation solution of fine-tuning problems impact credence in the theory. So I'll get to what these problems are, how inflation solves them in a moment. But this is one thing that I think is philosophically interesting. Um, how should the solution of fine-tuning problems uh, provide evidence for the theory? To what extent should it do so? And so I'll be talking about that in some detail. Another issue that's been important throughout the development of inflation is, how does inflation fit with other ideas in physics? And so in particular, since we're focusing on the intersection of cosmology and quantum gravity here, how does inflation fit with ideas in quantum gravity? And uh, I'm going to be almost entirely setting aside another issue. Some of you might have thought I should have invited Giordano Bruno to the dialogue as well. He would have uh, advocated the existence of many universes. I'm almost entirely setting aside the multiverse issues here today. And that's actually one of the main focuses of this recent debate that uh, Steinhardt and others have been uh, pushing. So I'm setting that aside just for uh, more practical reasons. I think it's also a very important and interesting issue, but I'm going to be setting that aside for this discussion. So in terms of this conference, we're looking at how cosmology and the foundational problems in cosmology intersect with quantum gravity. So in looking at inflation and quantum gravity, the question to ask is how does, how much, to what extent does inflation or the implementation of inflation actually depend upon assumptions regarding quantum gravity? So uh, can inflation uh, be formulated in such a way that it's uh, innocent of assumptions about quantum gravity or does it actually depend on bets as to what the final theory of quantum gravity is going to look like? Now I'm going to argue that yes, it does uh, depend on assumptions regarding quantum gravity in two senses. One is in an assessment of the pre-inflationary initial state. How do we assess what's a plausible initial state? And although I'll say less about this, I think this will become uh, more prominent in some of the later talks during the conference, that the description of the dynamics of the fields during inflationary expansion also uh, reflects assumptions regarding quantum gravity. So um, I should acknowledge, by the way, at the outset, so I'm going to be talking about the initial state as if I know what I'm talking about. There's a bit of looseness here. So I think the best way of understanding uh, in a sort of rough and ready way what I mean by initial state is something like initial data specified on a space like hypersurface at an early time where we think of this as somehow characterizing the limit of general relativity. But then if you press, on, press me on this, I have to admit the, the phrase limit of general relativity here is something that I don't really know how to characterize in more detail. And I think it's unclear, and this is often true, that within physical theories, until you have a successor theory, it's often unclear exactly what the limit of domain of applicability of the previous theory was. So I think it's actually unclear how to think about the emergence of classical spacetime, at what stage you can specify this initial data, and similarly, what does it mean to specify initial data? So should I think of it as specifying the complete set of all the modes of a field on a space like hypersurface? Would some of those modes be going beyond the limit of applicability or not? So I acknowledge there's a bit of vagueness in this, but for the purposes of this talk, just think of this as 
the initial state is the boundary of applicability of general relativity. Okay. Um, so then, in outline, um, since I'm giving the first talk, I'm going to remind you of things that you probably all already know, and some of you played a role in inventing, so I'm hoping that Fermi's pleasure principle applies. This is a phrase due to Jeremy Butterfield. That, uh, you should never under, underestimate the pleasure of hearing something that you already know well. <laughs> so I'm hoping that that is true. Um, then I'll go on to say something about fine-tuning. That will be the, the main focus of the talk. And then uh, and something more briefly about inflation as an effective field theory. So the, uh, the standard way that you see textbook presentations of inflation uh, motivate the introduction of the idea goes back to... Uh, a way of thinking about the theory uh, introduced by Alan Guth. So there are a lot of uh, ideas around at the time, but the focus on the horizon and flatness problem is something that uh, was due to Guth. So the horizon problem arises due to the causal structure of FLRW spacetimes. Um, and this is greatly exaggerated, but imagine that we have an early surface here that corresponds to the surface of last scattering. If this is our past light cone, then regions from which we are receiving uh, photons from different parts of the surface of last scattering, their past light cones do not overlap, just because there isn't enough space time uh, below here for these to overlap. So, and this is greatly exaggerated, those two would actually be far closer together. And so, because of the causal structure, the claim is, we would have a number of, a huge number of causally disconnected regions that we see in the surface of last scattering. And it's uh, surprising that the photons from these uh, causally disconnected regions are at the same temperature. How did, it, uh, how did the universe come to have a uniform temperature? Uh, a similar uh, issue arises with regard to understanding the dynamics of the FLRW models. These are phase-based diagrams where we have omega, the total uh, energy density, um, as a function of the scale factor. And just under FLR dynamics, what these illustrate is that um, under the standard FLRW dynamics, we have omega evolving rapidly away from one under evolution. So if the omega is slightly away from one, as the scale factor increases, as the universe expands, it will go rapidly away from one. So it's surprising that we find omega to still be very close to one today. Um, and I'll come back to the other diagram in a moment. So these are then taken to be uh, fine-tuning problems because it seems that the standard cosmology requires us to have this sort of enormous pre-established harmony. We have to have these causally disconnected patches that agree with one another, and also they have to be very close to a flat uh, solution. So this seems to require an enormous amount of fine-tuning. and. A stage of inflation, which is a stage of exponential expansion in the very early universe, can solve these problems in the following sense. The first is that the horizon distance will be stretched uh, during the stage of inflation. So um, that means that there will be, in, in a sense, you're taking this surface and extending it down, then there will be uh, space and time enough for these past light cones to overlap. And secondly, then, the dynamical uh, evolution of omega is reversed during a stage of inflation. It's driven towards one rather than away from one under the standard uh, dynamics. And so what we have then is, rather than uh, pre-established harmony, we have something that looks like, a, um, it looks like it's in accord with this idea of indifference, that starting with almost any initial conditions, the output will be a uniform flat patch as the generic post-inflationary state for a sufficiently large n where n is the, uh, a measure of how long the inflationary stage goes on. And this last bit is actually the most important. This is the, the most significant feature uh, that lends itself to then detailed observational tests, which is that the vacuum fluctuations of the inflaton field, which we assume to be in a vacuum state, get stretched during uh, uh, the inflationary evolution, and then they freeze in as classical density perturbations, and the standard calculations uh, are uh, going to show that these will have uh, specific features, namely Gaussian and nearly scale invariant. And I think in several talks later, we'll hear a lot more detail about aspects of this. This is just meant to be 
a quick review of the kind of textbook uh, case for inflation. And what I want to emphasize is that there's uh, a perspective on the initial state that is involved in this presentation, which um, I think can be summarized as follows. So we have a fine-tuning problem initially. Why are the perturbed FLRW models so effective? Why is it that those are effective in describing the universe? Um, and this seems puzzling because of the horizon and flatness problems. Also, although I haven't emphasized it as much, the, uh, the vacuum fluctuations lead to this spectrum for density perturbations. These are what we need to see structure formation such as galaxies. And there's, uh, uh, in addition to the horizon flatness problems, there's a basic question about how could you causally produce seeds, of structure form uh, seeds for structure formation with the appropriate features. Um, so why is it that the standard cosmology is so effective? And the textbook account of inflation is that a generic pre-inflationary state driven through inflation will give you a starting point for the now standard model of cosmology. So we'll give you the setup for what comes next in the standard account of cosmology. It'll be a uniform flat patch, and then you'll have the right spectrum of density perturbations to see later structure formation. Okay, so I wanna emphasize, and Professor Skarabinsky is here, so this is particularly embarrassing to be talking about someone else's work <laughs> um, who, who's here at the meeting, but there isn't, so this is sort of the standard textbook account of inflation, but it's striking that that isn't the only way of thinking about this set of ideas. And Starobinsky's model, and I'm, uh, I hope I've gotten this correct, was motivated directly from quantum gravity. Um, the, the initial idea was to add a term to the Einstein-Hilbert action, and then um, to incorporate quantum corrections. And then you can hypothesize that if that is the Einstein-Hilbert action, the modified action for gravity, you can see that an early disinter phase will be a solution to that. So rather than having this uh, analysis in terms of washing away a generic initial state, the methodology is very different. If you hypothesize an early disinter phase, it solves several problems. First of all, it avoids the initial singularity that you'd have in the FLRW models. And you can then have a description of a transition into FLRW expansion. Here, the main point I want to emphasize, and so this is, um, uh, Starobinsky refers to Misner, who had this idea of an initial chaos, very similar to what I've described as a standard way of thinking about uh, inflation. But he's very explicit in saying this is the methodology here in these uh, early papers is the opposite of this idea of indifference. Rather than trying to wash away dependence on an initial state, you actually are hypothesizing uh, a desider phase as an early state, and then you, lead, you end up with the same predictions as inflation. So the, the, the point I want to make here is that there's a standard way of thinking about inflation. That's not necessarily, the methodology doesn't necessarily go directly with the dynamics that can come apart. And you can see uh, this even historically that this is a very different approach um, to developing the theory. Okay, so I want to then, uh, I guess this will probably be uh, the bulk of the talk, look at this question of, whether, uh, to what extent inflation alleviates fine-tuning problems and how this should impact our credence in the theory and how this connects with assumptions about quantum gravity. So, and here, again, going back in the history, this was something that uh, there is an argument against the idea that inflation could effectively solve fine-tuning in the way that the sort of textbook wisdom presents it and it's doing um, Penrose gave an argument against this idea very early on. So this was a review of a conference proceedings from the Nuffield Workshop in 1981, I believe. He stated this argument and he's sort of come back to it repeatedly since then. Um, and other people have commented on this. And this is a, a, an argument just based on thermodynamics that uh, inflation actually requires a lower entropy state for it to work. So it, it can't do what the standard uh, textbook uh, account says, it doesn't work for a generic initial state, you actually have to have a special initial state for inflation to work. So uh, I think this is maybe his crispest formulation of this. As I said, this is a, a, a idea that he's returned to repeatedly, but this is from um, a book, The Road to Reality, from 2004, I believe. 
And this is, I think, his most succinct formulation of the argument. Um, there is, however, something fundamentally misconceived about trying to explain the uniformity of the early universe as resulting from a thermalization process. Whether this is a uniformity in the background temperature, the matter density, or in the space-time geometry generally. Indeed, it is fundamentally misconceived to try to explain why the universe is special in any particular respect by appealing to a therm thermalization process. For if the thermalization is actually doing anything, such as making temperatures in different regions more equal than they were before, then it represents a definite increasing of the entropy. Thus, the universe would have been even more special before the thermalization than after. So again, this is a very general argument that if you have a process of thermalization, which is generally increasing the entropy, for it to work, you actually have to have still a constraint on the initial state. So the idea of giving a generic initial state and then having inflation produce the output that it does, he thinks is problematic. Yes. But why should we think, or necessarily think, of uh, accelerated expansion as a thermalization process? What, why, why, why are the two identified? Well, um, so I guess part of the question is going to come up later. So do you think of the dynamics governing inflation as irreversible or not? So how do you describe the dynamics during the inflationary phase? Right? And so if you think of it as an irreversible dynamical evolution, then this argument will apply. So I'll, I'll get back to this in a moment. So, um, so I think it really comes down to how do you characterize the evolution during the inflationary phase. So thermalization, sorry, Jim, you had a... No, you should finish. I have a yeah. clarificatory question. So uh, again, I think this is, thermalization is just a very general term. What uh, I think we see is that you have irreversible dynamics during, evolu during the inflationary stage. And his general claim is that you have to have some constraints on the initial state for that ir irreversible evolution um, to occur. So, the, uh, so I don't think much hangs on the, the label of thermalization. This is just meant to be a, 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 to make it, uh, to sort of allude to a more general argument that is familiar. Yeah, Jim. So the, this exchange made me think that maybe I didn't understand what Penrose was saying. So I thought that he was just talking about pre-inflation, mm -hmm. whatever was going to become the observable universe would have a chance to thermalize before expanding. So he's talking about why we see the same CM well, I think, but I think it's meant to be more generic. So the, so um, you might think that. So I think this is meant to be more generic than that. But yeah. So one thought is, why is it that we see the same uniform temperature? Well, you now have uh, thermal interactions between distinct parts of the universe, and those are allowed to then come to the same temperature through some sort of thermalization, right? I think this is meant to be more general, um, in the sense that. Uh, and again, this is, maybe I'm hanging too much on this particular characterization, I just thought it was a, a sort of a nice summary, but the, uh, in other contexts where he's a little more careful, the overall claim is just that you have the dynamics occurring during inflation, Will uh, there are various irreversible processes that take place, and we know that in general you have to have a constraint on the initial entropy, you don't have an arbitrary initial state that's compatible with uh, these equations. Right, so, yeah, so I, I think I'll, I'll, we can come back to this in discussion if you'd like, Daniel, but the, I think here this might be hanging a little bit too much on the, the particular formulation that Penrose gives in this, uh, in this uh, treatment. So, um, Robert, have a finger too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so my view on this is that entropy is only created at the end of inflation. And it's the size increase during inflation that leads to the fact that the entropy after inflation is so much bigger than the entropy before inflation. So we don't have thermal equilibrium during inflation. It's going back to the question you're asking. Okay, so um, let me... Yes. Yeah, that's come. I think well, all these issues also depend on what in which language are we supposed to be talking? Because if we are talking about a theory of quantum gravity, in which the fundamental degrees of freedom are probably not our standard space-time degrees mm -hmm. of freedom, mm 
entropy would have to be computed in a very different way than the way we would compute entropy right. by considering you know, some measure on the space of metrics or something like that. So, Right, I mean, even in classical general relativity, it's unclear how to yeah. uh, precisely of define course. entropy. Yeah, so I think exactly. there's a number of really... It's not only that it's, deep, it, it, it's difficult, that the issue is difficult, mm -hmm. but if space and is emergent, the question would have to be raised in a different language. No, I think that's right. I think that's right. Um, okay, so let me try to uh, move on here, though. I think we've uh, broached some very important questions. I don't mean to be suggesting that uh, I've resolved them in any sense. Um, so underlying this, though, is uh, so Penrose has a kind of neo botsmanian view of how to think about thermodynamics, in which he does think that there's a phase space in which we can consider the entropy as corresponding to a volume of the space space. And so he has these, uh, uh, in various places, these sorts of fanciful diagrams where uh, his view is that there's um, He's sort of of the opposite camp. The initial state should be very tightly constrained. And this is uh, uh, reflected in uh, the very low entropy of the initial state that would be required for even inflation to work on his view, which he describes as the creator picking a very small element of phase-based volume. And so he argues that there should be a constraint that forces the creator to, to pick that sort of very improbable initial state. But I think the, the problem with this point of view and this sort of uh, line of criticism is, what is the physical significance of this phase space measure? So even granting that we might not have the correct description of the phase space and we might not have uh, a, a, an appropriate measure, even if we grant that we have those, why would that measure have any direct physical significance? And so here, um, I think there's a jump in thinking about the, the measure where we start to ascribe physical significance to it based on a mistake about how to understand statistical mechanics. Um, so in equilibrium statistical mechanics, we know, of course, that we, if we have a system and we want to calculate its observable quantities, and it's a system that's uh, reached equilibrium, we can use equilibrium measures to calculate its properties very successfully. Sometimes those seem to be justified by a principle of indifference, that we should assign a uniform measure over the phase space just because of uh, an appeal to the principle of indifference. So why would we uh, assign more uh, probability to one region of phase space than another? That is sometimes actually used in statistical mechanics, mechanics textbooks as a way of justifying the use of uh, an equilibrium measure. But I think that's actually really misleading because there's, in fact, a much more detailed dynamical justification that has to go into place to say why it is that you should use an equilibrium measure and how to understand that measure. So, um, and in particular, um, in the dynamical justification, there are features of the system that will be important to qualify whether you should use the equilibrium, equilibrium measure in understanding its properties. Has it been isolated for a long time compared to its dynamical relaxation time? Um, and uh, how do you characterize the dynamics of the system as it's approaching equilibrium? So I think that the use of equilibrium measures, the fact that that measure has any physical significance, has to reflect this more full dynamical justification. Now, in cosmological models, we can, uh, and there's a construction due to Gibbons, Hawking, and Stewart from 1987, where for a certain type of cosmological models, you can construct a measure on the phase space of these models. But, uh, and here there's a, a nice paper uh, that I'm following by Schiffer and Wald that illustrates the difficulties <coughs> with taking that measure as having the kind of physical significance that Penrose wants to attribute to it. So um, there's two different issues. One is just that the kind of dynamical justification that we could use in statistical mechanics just doesn't carry over directly to this uh, case of cosmology. The kinds of uh, properties that you can appeal to, there's no analog of those in the case of cosmological models. You don't have any sense in which you're cycling through the phase space uh, or any of those sorts of features. The other point is that the, this phase space is actually not compact. And so you have to introduce some way of regular, regularizing the measure in order to calculate probabilities for things that you're interested in. And most of the answers then that you would get for trying to ask about probabilistic results are going to be dependent on that choice of regularization. Um, and so 
We might want to ask questions given a space of cosmological models like the following. What is the probability that omega is approximately one at some time? Or given the current state, there is an inflationary stage in the past. Um, and one of the features of this recent discussion that Steinhardt and others have raised, uh, there's, they want to argue that contrary to the claims that some advocates of inflation made, it isn't in fact high probability that you would have, uh, that there's an inflationary stage in the past. So there's a debate about whether it's likely that inflation occurred, how probable is inflation, and there are advocates on both sides of this position. What I think they agree on is that it's sensible to calculate a probability here. What they disagree is there's a really dramatic disagreement about what that probability is. So uh, if you look at these two papers, Gibbons and Turok, for example, calculate a very low probability that inflation occurred, whereas Carroll and Tam um, calculate a very high probability that inflation occurred. But this is really uh, just reflects the point about regularization dependence, what in fact is going on is that they're choosing different ways of regularizing the measure in order to calculate these probabilities. So you have to introduce some further structure to calculate either of these probabilities, and they do it in different ways. And so they don't actually agree because they're adopting different ways of regularizing the measure. And I think the, the response to this is not to try harder to understand the mathematical details of these measures, but I think this all just reflects the under, the, the, the realization that we don't know enough to assign probability in this context. So we can confidently talk about probabilities in physics in cases where we have a good understanding of the source of randomness in a system that we're studying, and then we can associate that or characterize that in terms of probabilities. In this case, we're asking, do we have a, a, an understanding of the randomness associated with initial conditions? I don't think we yet have that in the classical phase space descriptions of cosmology that we're using. So here's a spot where if we had a given quantum gravity theory, such as a wave function of the universe, that might give us an understanding of the randomness associated with initial conditions. That would motivate a probability measure. But these approaches just don't have sufficient grounds for justifying um, an assignment of probabilities. So I think there's uh, an alternative way of thinking about uh, probabilities in this context. So one thing to emphasize is that in the thermal history of the universe, we have a variety of processes that are irreversible, that involve time asymmetric dynamics. So if you think about things like Big Bang nucleosynthesis or the freeze out of other uh, species as uh, the universe expands, these are all uh, in structure formation by gravitational clumping. These are all uh, irreversible processes that involve uh, time asymmetric dynamical equations. And similarly with inflation, in the description of density perturbations, we're looking at growing modes of the inflaton field. Uh, we have a quantum to classical transition. We might hear about this more later. Uh, that at some point those growing modes freeze into classical density perturbations. And we also have a process, again, I'll, I'll just mention this, but the decay of the inflaton field at the end of inflation to reheat the universe. These are all irreversible processes. Sorry, I'm, I'm confused. When you are talking about irreversible, you are you're, you're, you're not talking about fundamental laws of physics. You are talking about somehow already taking into account the thermodynamics. Yeah, so this would be for... Evolving to it. So we are already talking about assuming a very special state and assuming a very... So the irreversibility yeah, you are talking about depends upon the thing you are trying to explain. So I don't understand the irreversibility. Because <coughs> I want to make sure I understand. Yeah, no, no, You're so not talking about irre irre irreversibility at the fundamental level. Right? No, so at the fundamental level, we have uh, uh, a theory of quantum uh, fields or a theory of general relativity that's time reversal invariant. What I'm saying is that we actually, in thinking about a variety of processes in cosmology, we describe them using irreversible dynamics. Right. So the question is, how do we arrive at that? You're exactly right. We have to have. Um, some kind of uh, special initial state that constrains whether you have that irreversible dynamics apply. So you're right, I'm assuming that, so it's partly I'm saying the dynamics that we're describing cosmology with successfully incorporate all these irreversible uh, equations. And so we will already have to have some constraint on the special state for these dynamical equations to apply. 
Um, but let me let me go on. So so the 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 point I want to make here is just that if we have irreversible dynamics, the way we should think about historical inferences or retrodiction is different than if we had completely time reversal invariant dynamics. So that uh, and this is just familiar from thermodynamics. If you have irreversible processes uh, that are relevant for the system that you're looking at, if you try to uh, retrodict what the earlier state of the system is, um, you will generally go wrong if you take the uniform measure, the equilibrium measure on phase space and try to evolve backwards, you will get the wrong results. So uh, a different way of thinking about historical inferences in a system that's governed by irreversible equations is to say, what we should ask is, is there a plausible uh, initial state and then evolve that forward to see what we would get. And uh, in this context, I'm saying that the way of thinking about probabilities, I think we should take into account that we have irreversible dynamics that uh, applies in cosmology. And uh, then we can ask, um, and there's some uh, recent work by uh, philosophers, uh, Wayne Mervold and David Wallace, that I think uh, looks at this in terms that's uh, uh, more, the, the, the language is more from the physics literature in terms of attractor dynamics. So do you have equations that have this feature of being dynamical attractors so that you can say that initial distributions, even though there's some constraint on them, will converge towards an equilibrium state. So then the probabilities you can apply will be after some relaxation time, then you can uh, apply something like equilibrium probabilities. And so, and this is the constraint that you're uh, uh, highlighting it's not the case that all initial states will evolve in a way that's compatible with these irreversible equations. We have to put some constraints on those initial states in order for the irreversible dynamics to follow. Um, and so the proposal I'm making is that we should think of historical inferences in cosmology as having a different character, that we want to propose an initial state forward evolve it and then check the consequences given that we have a lot of irreversible dynamics in the system. And then the question is not what's the probability of the initial state, it's rather what's the plausibility of the restrictions that we need to place on that initial state so that we can apply the irreversible dynamical equations. Um, and so in the case of inflation, uh, Robert has a very nice review of uh, work along these lines uh, from a few years ago. There's a whole uh, line of work devoted, I mean, it goes back to Goldworth and Prawn, have a nice paper from 1992. There's a whole line of analytic and numerical studies that look at inflation and try to characterize its attractor behavior. Now, the very general question is really challenging. What you'd want to be able to say is, imagine that I just had a region of space time in which I've specified some uh, characterization of the metric, so maybe it's a, uh, uh, you know, the initial data for the Cauchy problem for general relativity, and then the fields driving inflation and the other matter fields, can I say that that region will inflate, or under what conditions will that region inflate? Um, that would be very challenging. The, a lot of the results are focused on homogeneous models, and then there are some generalizations away from that. But you'd want to be able to ask then, under what, so for what initial data would you have a phase of quasi disorder expansion? Then you might also want to ask further, how long would that phase of quasi disorder expansion um, last? So if you have a, a, a general answer to this question, then you'd be able to say, here's the basin of attraction. Here's the set of initial states that will generically lead to an inflationary state. Um, so far, the, dependent, the answers are very model dependent. So for different types of inflation, so small field versus large field uh, refers to how much the field excursion is. So that's how much in energy does the field change over the course of inflation. And so for small field inflation, um, this is a problem that was recognized very uh, in the early days. It just seems unlikely that you find the inflaton field in the appropriate state at the outset of inflation. It'd be hard to get it into an equilibrium state. Whereas uh, large field inflation models have uh, more plausible initial conditions. But here then, the claim, where would quantum gravity come in? It's really, what is the plausibility of these uh, initial states for inflation? So given the results about how inflation can function as an attractor dynamics, do we fall within that basin of attraction? 
And here I think there's really, um, just because there's uh, many different approaches to quantum gravity, uh, I think you can uh, ask in each of those, what would it say about the different uh, initial conditions for inflation and whether those are plausible? Um, and I don't, uh, I haven't uh, looked at the work on this systematically. There's a few results where people will argue, uh, you know, uh, based on one approach to quantum gravity, whether a specific type of inflationary initial condition is plausible. So this is my suggestion for how to reformulate the question. I don't think we have a handle on assigning probabilities based on phase space measures. That seems ill-defined and unjustified. I think we can instead ask about the attractor behavior of inflation and then the real impact of quantum gravity will be to give us an assessment of whether the states we would expect from a quantum gravity theory pre-inflation are plausible and fall within the basin of attraction for inflationary models once we have characterized them. Okay, so um, let me very briefly, because I think uh, I've taken up a large chunk of my time already. Um, there's another set of questions more about now the dynamics of inflation. So I've been focusing mainly on how to understand fine-tuning problems and uh, the initial state. The other set of questions relate to how we describe the dynamics of inflation and whether we can think of it as an effective field theory in the way that particle physicists tend to think of the standard model, for example, as an effective field theory. So the standard calculations you will see in a textbook treatment of inflation um, describe the evolution of perturbations, again, this is really the, the essential uh, ingredient of inflation for connecting with uh, observations of the CMB. The evolution of perturbations will de be de described using tools from quantum field theory and curved space-time, where you take the background space-time that's effectively fixed and look at how the, the fields evolve within that background. And then you make some uh, assumption, for example, that the vacuum state at the start of inflation is a bunch Davies vacuum. And, uh, and then show uh, how that evolves through an inflationary phase. And the very general question is, how sensitive are these calculations to quantum gravity effects? So can we trust this dynamics as an effective low energy uh, field theory for some further theory of quantum gravity? And here, um, there's a problem that uh, Robert will tell us about in more detail in the next talk that uh, goes back to a paper with, uh, that he co-authored in 2001. There's one source of worry, which is just that for sufficiently large periods of inflation, so if you, you can think of inflation as giving you something like a magnifying glass, as it's stretching modes during the inflationary phase, for sufficiently large periods of inflation, what you will be magnifying into the seeds for structure formation at a later stage are actually uh, modes that are a length scale below the Planck scale initially. <coughs> so this is called the trans-Planckian problem because you're taking something which you have, in some sense, good reason to be skeptical about, namely the description of the quantum field theory at a very, very small length scale, uh, a trans-Planckian length scale. You're actually magnifying that through inflation. And so the natural question to ask is how sensitive are inflationary predictions to modifications at, at this length scale. So if we think that quantum gravity might lead to modifications of the description at that scale, how will that change the inflationary predictions? And so this is a, a problem that Robert emphasized in 2001, and this has then led to a lot of discussions, and we'll hear more about the trans planckian problem shortly. Um, another point is just that if you think about energy, uh, the possible energy scales of inflation, Usually in thinking about effective field theories, you'd like to see that there's a separation of energy scales such that you can neglect the high energy uh, scales and that there's then a low energy field theory that you can treat as an effective field theory. But for some of the large field models for inflation, inflation can take place at a very high energy scale. Um, and this can be comparable, depending on uh, different views in string theory, uh, to energy scales that appear in string theory. So in that case, in that scenario, then you couldn't treat inflation as a low energy effective field theory. There isn't the uh, uh, necessary uh, separation of scales that will allow you to see it as um, an effective field theory. And finally, um, and this is something which uh, I think is quite interesting, but I don't have a firm enough grip on to say more about, but there's also just the possibility that low energy effective field theories 
incorporating gravity are really misleading, and this is something that there have been a number of swampland conjectures about in the string theory community, which would uh, show that some low energy effective field theories are not actually viable. That there's conjectures about constraints that string theory will place on this space of models such that some of what look like physically plausible low energy effective field theories are in fact not allowed by string theory. So that would then lead to a much more dramatic uh, reorientation that a lot of the things that just look like uh, viable theories are ruled out by these uh, theories of quantum gravity. Um, so again, this really... And Sorry. Yeah. What position do you take then in that case? Because you could either view it in the way you just have mm -hmm. described it, or you could say, well, since apparently in our world this seems to be described by one of these uh, theories, this suggests that perhaps string theory is not the free theory of quantum gravity. Yeah, I think that's a very hard question. So you're asking, so should we take inflation to be well enough supported that we demand that our theory of quantum gravity allows it to happen? Or if quantum gravity... Well, for one, we have very clear predictions that seem mm -hmm. to be backed up by evidence. I, so again, so, I think this is... Uh, oh, sorry, did you... Yeah, so wait for my talk. I'll try to persuade you that the predictions are not at all. Predictions are confirmed in this one power. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> so, yeah. Can I add one thing? Yes. Uh, but it is true, however, that uh, you can read uh, the result that uh, in inflation is in the swamp land uh, as a statement that uh, uh, string theory is in the swamp land. Mm. <laughs> right, I mean, I think the, 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 the point I want to make, which is more general, is just, and uh, actually we can go back to the 17th century context, where uh, I understand the physics better. <laughs> um, there's often worries that you have an illusion of contingency or an illusion of a physical space of possibilities that isn't actually there. So in the context of the discussions of the origin of the planetary system, um, there is no, at the time when Newton and Descartes were writing, there's no understanding of the nebular hypothesis of the way that you could have a system form. And so that actually constrains what's physically possible based on the dynamics that you already have in play. And so. What I think is interesting is the general uh, feature that sometimes when you're formulating a fine-tuning problem, you're assuming that there's a space of possibilities that might not be accurate, that might actually be radically different. And so, yeah, I think there's a, a question about where you place your bets. Do you think that string theory is uh, accurately describing the physical modalities, or do you think that inflation is right and we should constrain quantum gravity based on its compatibility with inflation? That's a hard question. My point is just that quantum gravity could really and it could be loop quantum gravity, it could be other approaches, could really radically restructure what you think of as physically possible. Sorry, that yeah. was exactly what I was trying to emphasize. So I think the best way of reading uh, this type of result mm -hmm. is as a constraint on possibilities. Uh, mm -hmm. When you read it uh, one way or the other, right. depends on what your evidence is uh, one way or the other. Right. It's no, I, I agree with that. Okay, so I actually, I think I only have one more slide. So. Um, so rather than concluding, uh, I want to return to imagine a dialogue that we could uh, have starting now. Um, so the uh, character Simplicio could say, even if at the Planck time God had given the world only the form of a chaos, by inflation alone everything would in the course of time have come to be smooth and flat with just the right wrinkles to seed structural formation. We can happily continue to pursue cosmology without waiting for the theorists to finish a theory of quantum gravity. Obviously, that's the kind of line that I've been criticizing. So I think that uh, I'm, uh, that's one of the, uh, I think, sort of standard views that's gone along with inflation, but I think it's uh, got serious problems. So we have Salviati saying, no, inflation may make it easier to generate a universe like ours from what seem like plausible initial conditions, but we still have to place some constraints on the initial state. We don't know what those are or whether inflationary dynamics is in fact a good approximation, there's still an opportunity to discover features of quantum gravity through studying cosmology. And then Segredo, the empiricist, of course, weighs in. Even if you agree on these questions, inflation should do more than just fit the available data. For me to accept this enormous extrapolation, it must guide us to further discoveries about the early universe that we can independently test. And the debate goes on. So, thank you. Okay.
Okay, we have about 15 minutes for questions. Okay. So uh, we'll use the convention and philosophy of a hand for a question and a finger for a follow up. Okay, <coughs> uh, so um, let me first add some keyboard to, to, to your discussion about, about measure. About, about measure. I think uh, 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 what is crucial in discussing any model, in particular in inflation, but not only inflation, is if uh, it's uh, if the measure of uh, uh, the, the, the solution in the space of all, all possible initial time conditions is zero or not zero, and that this is crucial. Um, if, it's, if it is zero, this means that this uh, theoretical construction is unstable and uh, one we should not expect to find the nature. If it's not zero, okay, that this means that it can be found somewhere in space and time. And is it um, typical or untypical? It, it, it completely it depends on your assumptions about initial conditions before of this event, in, in particular speaking about inflation, about pre inflation initial conditions. And in particular, this difference which you mentioned in the estimates of the, of the probability of inflation, I worked on this myself and other people too, the main difference in particular is in the assumption of what was before inflation. If you assume that um, there was some space-time with low curvature, then indeed I completely agree that it's not that the still inflation or inflationary models, in particular my models, they have no zero measure in the space of initial conditions, so this measure is not zero, but once more, it is small if you assume that um, inflation um, produced from something with lower curvature, but if, if, you, if you assume that before inflation was something even more curved, even more curved and, and more and as a topic more, more, more chaotic, then it's a best, it just the opposite that uh, the uh, uh, twist probability is large and uh, those people who obtain this large value, they in fact expect this. And let me finish by um, uh, speaking, um, present you to a similar example from the usual, the usual gravity, not inflation, not quantum gravity. It's black holes. An uh, example of a generic solution in uh, um, unusual Einstein gravity are, are carried black holes. So the, uh, and the statement that this solution is generic this, uh, simply means that black holes exist somewhere. But this does not mean that black holes are omnipresent. But fortunately for us, there are no black holes in this room and in our, in our solar system. So, uh, uh, so uh, just adding to your last um, ripple, I comment by, I think by Sagreda, uh, once more, uh, the statement that inflation is generic uh, simply means that we uh, can find it somewhere in space-time. And, uh, and the question if do we uh, origin from this initial, uh, from this piece of space-time or from other pieces, I think that this cannot be uh, defined by um, a philosophical argument, but only that using on concrete inflationary predictions, okay, and uh, compare them with observations. Um, thank you. So, um, uh, there's a lot in there. I mean, I think the the general thrust of my argument was very sympathetic with focusing on dy dynamical stability assessments where really, as you say, you want to be able to show that there's an open set of initial data that will lead to a certain set of results. And I didn't mean to be, so the arguments I was criticizing were really, I think, an attempt to do something more than that with the measure. But then if you have a model, a specific model in mind or a variety of models, you can uh, formulate the question of, 
whether there's an open set of initial data that leads to a certain type of dynamical evolution much more precisely. And that's the, the kind of study of whether a particular dynamical equation is an attractor solution that I think is the more promising way of using probability. But once more, uh, from the fact you, uh, once more, uh, I think that it's an, uh, 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 what is called, idea of the fix to, uh, to uh, obtain some the only possible initial conditions. So I would, uh, my opinion that, okay, uh, 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 there was uh, uh, something before inflation and looking in any complete model that comes from by observations, looking which pre-initially can, uh, conditions were more probable, uh, uh, we may uh, obtain some information about pre inflationary history, but once more, one more uh, keyword, uh, which is almost forgotten by uh, it philosophers and even specialists in the fact of physics, but all, all astronomers, astronomers use it. One uh, should not uh, forget about cosmic dynamics. The, the fact that our that we absorb only one event, and so in case of one event, the, uh, one should uh, calculate not only energy values for inequal quantity, but dispersion. And in case of one event, it may be clear that the dispersion is so large that uh, the, uh, it's still not possible that our uh, universe originated from some one rather um, uh, 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 un improbable event due to cosmic variance. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I think the issue of cosmic variance is a really important one, and I, I mean, I think that's yeah, very important to bring that up. I don't have much to add to what you said. Actually, I, well, I remind you that we all already see rather, no, well, a little bit not a very probable event in case of in case of cosmic problem. Mm, right. We have a follow up from Ray. Yeah, um, I think since you are talking about measure one important question is how measure is defined mm -hmm. and from a mathematical point of view. So I wonder whether the result is going to be the same if you have another definition of measure. Because I fear that sometimes the way you ask the question is the answer which you get. And I don't think mathematically is clear how you define the measure. So that's an open question. Um, so I wasn't actually meaning to do anything on, that was sort of non-traditional in the way of thinking about a measure. I mean, it's really just a generalization of the notion of an area to... I know, but it's not a unique way of defining a measure. That's why I'm saying that uh, given that... Everybody right, so, you, so that's, that's an important question. Before we go, what the answer is, how the result depends on the definition of measure and whether mathematically this is a well-established answer to what measure is. And I think this is an open question. Right, so I think there's uh, two questions. One is, um, um, can you pick a unique measure and what sort of criteria would you use to pick that? So the, in the case of the GHS construction, it's on a, it's on a Hamiltonian, uh, so you give a Hamiltonian Sorry, formulation. The GHS? Uh, Gibbons Hawking Stewart, the, ah. the 1987. So there, I think it's a fairly well-defined notion of how you arrive at that measure. Now, there are other, so if you just ask in general, how do you define a measure on a space of cosmological models, you might not have the same level of structure that they have, and then you might not have a unique measure that's sort of naturally picked out by the dynamics. In that context, though, I think it's fairly clear, you know, what criteria they use to construct the measure. The problem is, though, because it's a... a uh, not regular, right? so it's uh, not, you know, the, the uh, phase space has infinite measure, then in order to answer the questions, you have to introduce further structure to get finite probabilities, and there you have a huge source of ambiguity. Yeah, exactly, that's yeah. what I mean. Okay, so we have at least three questions in five minutes, so let's try to be a little bit brief. So Josh. Uh, uh, so this is perfect, because it actually is a finger on that question, but it's independent. Originally, you know, what are the the different regularizations that individuals have chosen um, to get us to finite probabilities? Are they motivated by uh, philosophical, physical 
principles? Or can you tell us more about the regularization schemes, or are they just... So the, the contrast between the Gibbons and Turok and the Carroll and Tam, it really boils down to whether you think of assigning probabilities uh, well after inflation or before inflation. So there's technical details, which I'm not going to be able to recreate off the top of my head, but there's a, um, in effect, a scale factor dependence in the way you define the regularization procedure. And so you choose uh, that based on whether you think of a plant. So like Gibbons and Turok say, well, we're going to apply this well after inflation, where we think statistical mechanics is in hand. Um, I forget what Carol and Tam's motivation is, but that's what it boils down to is a kind of physical question of, are you looking at sort of which end of the process are you trying to define the measure? And the fact that it depends on that is one of the reasons why it seems like this is not actually tracking a real physical feature, because you'd like to have a measure that doesn't depend so strongly on a choice like that if you think that it's, you know, giving you an accurate understanding of the dynamics, so. Sorry, but I think things go becoming even more and more complicated because are you trying are we trying to assign a measure to space of met, met initial metrics, initial data for you know initial ABM or or a wave function with support on initial uh, such things, or perhaps we are trying to to, uh, to assign in, uh, a measure to a collection of uh, loop quantum gravity initial mm -hmm. states. And these two things may have absolutely nothing in common. Yeah, they're different spaces. So, and so, so, yeah, so this is, what are we talking about? So this, in this context, we're just talking about classical general relativity with a scalar field. It's mini superspace, so we've already restricted ourselves to FLRW models. And some of the, some of the constructions are able to do some in home, sort of some generalization away from that. But it's... But I think even, even, so, even, even in, 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 in a very limited situation, even if you have somehow bound your state, mm -hmm. how are we going to put measures on, on, on the space of metrics? What what metric are we going to use? Super, <coughs> super metric, which requires you know, further structure, or, or what? Like I said, I mean, I think this is a very specific construction. I think these problems of ambiguity still arise in this very specific construction. You're asking about a more general uh, construction that I think it would probably be even worse in that context. And as you say, I mean, there's another question, which is just, we have a phase space that we're putting a measure on. How do we know that it's the right phase space? If you had a loop quantum gravity space, presumably it'd be a different phase space entirely. Then you'd have a different way of uh, assigning a measure over that. So, I mean, I, again, I, part of my argument is that both sides of this debate, to some extent, have tried to appeal to these measure uh, theoretic results. And I just don't think we have a firm understanding of what probability means in this context. So I think we have to think of a different kind of result uh, as bearing the weight. I'm not sure what happened with the lights. <laughs> yeah, I was trying to understand how quantum gravity exactly is supposed to help, uh, regardless of the specific approach. So mm -hmm. the idea seems to be, for what I understood, that uh, we should expect quantum gravity to select uh, the wave function of the universe which from a general point of view is going to be some element in the physical Hilbert space of the theory. But I don't see on which grounds we expect that to be unique. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have a Hilbert space of states that solve all the dynamics of the theory. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we could have that. And it seems to me that we will be back in a situation like in GR, where we can only retrodict, retrodict uh, from uh, uh, known empirical facts uh, mm -hmm. what the correct solution is. Mm -hmm. The theory could provide additional constraints for mathematical consistency and so on, but I don't expect that we're going to have enough constraints to, right. to specify a unique possible state. Uh, I don't see on which ground we should expect that. Um, and one way in which it could help uh, it may be in exactly the opposite way, in the sense that uh, if we are in a context in which uh, the whole notion of space-time is emerging from some sort of coarse graining or approximation of a uh, different type of degrees of freedom, we could have rather uh, a very uh, broad universality class of uh, microscopic states uh, that lead uh, all to the sort of same uh, effective uh, continuum dynamics.
If in that affected dynamics we find inflation or something else, and we find uh, our type of semi-classical universe, then we may have solved the problem of initial state uh, in, a, in the totally opposite way. Right. Uh, so I would agree for the first time in my life with something that Simplicio has said <laughs> in the first uh, dialogue. Right. But not in the sense that there will be a law that will select a specific initial right. condition or will make it irrelevant because it's so, so low-like uh, that right. uh, it governs the behavior of the universe as a, as a, as a military right. army, but rather the other way around. It doesn't really matter what the degrees of freedom uh, really do at the fundamental level. The coarse-grained effective behavior will be mm. universal. That's really interesting. I mean, that's, uh, that's I think, a really interesting way of thinking about this that I hadn't considered. Uh, I will say, I mean, I'm, I'm with you on the worry about whether laws could actually single out a unique initial state. So one thing that's really odd about some discussions in cosmology, um, some cosmologists seem to have the intuition that uh, if you can't say why the universe had to be the way it is, then that's a flaw in the cosmological theory. Right? If, if the history of the universe is merely a possible history, according to the laws, there's some dissatisfaction. Right? The, 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 and this goes back to the question of, is there some way of selecting a unique initial state that gives the universe as we see it? So, uh, you know, and sometimes people phrase this as, well, the history of the universe as we see it shouldn't just be allowed, it should be highly probable, it should be um, a likely history. And I've never known quite what to make of those arguments. I mean, in physics, we have theories that apply all over the place, but we don't expect them, you know, the fact that there are situations which we can model in the theory which don't obtain as well isn't usually seen as a problem, right? So the, the idea that you have laws of cosmology that actually narrow us down to the unique state, that just seems like it would be different than any other physical theory we've had if we achieved that. And yet some people have the very strong intuition that that's what we should be aiming for. Um, but I agree, I think it's, it's hard to imagine that you actually have a unique initial state. Um, <laughs> so tracking a real physical feature because you'd like to have a measure that doesn't depend so strongly on a choice like that if you think that it's, you know, giving you an accurate understanding of the dynamics, so. Sorry, but I think things go, become even more, more complicated mm. because are, you trying, are we trying to assign a measure to space of met, met, initial metrics, initial data for you know, initial ABM uh, or, the, or a wave function with support on initial uh, such things, or perhaps we are trying to, to, uh, to assign an, uh, a measure to a collection of uh, loop quantum gravity initial mm. states. And these two things may have absolutely nothing in common. Yeah, they're different spaces. So, and so, so, yeah, so this is, what are we talking about? So this, in this context, we're just talking about classical general relativity with a scalar field. It's many super space, so we've already restricted ourselves to FLRW models. And some of the, some of the constructions are able to do some in home, sort of some generalization away from that. But it's, but I think even, even, so, even in, 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 very limited uh, situation. Even if you have somehow bound your state, mm -hmm. how are we going to put measures on on, on the space of metrics? What what metric are we going to use? Super <coughs> super metric, which requires you know standard structure, or, or or what? Like I said, I mean, I think this is a very specific construction. I think these problems of ambiguity still arise in this very specific construction. You're asking about a more general uh, construction that I think it would probably be even worse in that context. And as you say, I mean, there's another question which is just, we have a phase space that we're putting a measure on. How do we know that it's the right phase space? If you had a loop quantum gravity space, presumably it would be a different phase space entirely. Then you'd have a different way of uh, assigning a measure over that. So, I mean, I, again, I, part of my argument is that both sides of this debate, to some extent, have tried to appeal to these measure uh, theoretic results, and I just don't think we have a firm understanding of what probability means in this context. So I think we have to think of a different kind of result uh, as bearing the weight. I'm not sure what happened with the lights. <laughs> yeah, I was trying to understand how quantum gravity exactly is supposed to help, uh, regardless of the specific approach. So mm -hmm. 
the idea seems to be, for what I understood, that uh, we should expect quantum gravity to select uh, the wave function of the universe, which, from a general point of view, is going to be some element in the physical Hilbert space of the theory. But I don't see on which grounds we expect that to be unique. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have a Hilbert space of states that solve all the dynamics of the theory. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we could have that. Right. And it seems to me that we will be back in a situation like in GR, where we can only retrodict, retrodict uh, from uh, uh, known empirical facts uh, mm -hmm. what the correct solution is. Mm -hmm. The theory could provide additional constraints for mathematical consistency and so on, but I don't expect that we're going to have enough constraint to, right. to specify a unique possible state. Uh, I don't see on which ground we should expect that. Um, and one way in which it could help uh, may be in exactly the opposite way, in the sense that uh, if we are in a context in which uh, the whole notion of space-time is emerging from some sort of coarse graining or approximation of a uh, different type of degrees of freedom, we could have rather uh, a very uh, broad universality class of uh, microscopic states uh, that lead uh, all to the sort of same uh, effective uh, continuum dynamics. If in that effective dynamics we find inflation or something else, and we find uh, our type of semi-classical universe, then we may have solved the problem of initial state uh, in, a, in the totally opposite way. Right. Uh, so I would agree for the first time in my life with something that Simplicia said uh, <laughs> in the first uh, dialogue. Right. Right. But not in the sense that there will be a law that will select a specific initial right. condition or will make it irrelevant because it's so, so low-like uh, that right. uh, it governs the behavior of the universe as a, as a, as a military right. army, but rather the other way around. It doesn't really matter what the degrees of freedom uh, really do at the fundamental level. The coarse-grained effective behavior will be mm. universal. That's really interesting. I mean, that's, uh, that's, I think, a really interesting way of thinking about this that I hadn't considered. Uh, I will say, I mean, I'm, I'm with you on the worry about whether laws could actually single out a unique initial state. So one thing that's really odd about some discussions in cosmology, um, some cosmologists seem to have the intuition that uh, if you can't say why the universe had to be the way it is, then that's a flaw in the cosmological theory. Right? If, if the history of the universe is merely a possible history, according to the laws, there's some dissatisfaction, right? The, 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 and this goes back to the question of, is there some way of selecting a unique initial state that gives the universe as we see it? So, uh, you know, and sometimes people phrase this as, well, the history of the universe as we see it shouldn't just be allowed, it should be highly probable, it should be um, a likely history. And I've never known quite what to make of those arguments. I mean, in physics, we have theories that apply all over the place, but we don't expect them, you know, the fact that there are situations which we can model in the theory which don't obtain as well isn't usually seen as a problem, right? So the, the idea that you have laws of cosmology that actually narrow us down to the unique state, that just seems like it would be different than any other physical theory we've had if we achieved that. And yet some people have the very strong intuition that that's what we should be aiming for. Um, but I agree, I think it's, it's hard to imagine that you'd actually have a unique initial state. Um. <laughs> so, we are out of time, I'm sorry, I know that there are hands and fingers. There will be plenty of opportunities to corner Chris during a coffee break or lunch, so let's thank our speakers.